Alfred Newman had already been manufacturing high quality brass here within Birmingham. However, this factory was specifically built for the manufacture of coffin fittings. In this period, Joseph Chamberlain, who has been three times Lord Mayor of Birmingham, had actually decided to clear the back-to-backs. In fact, in this area, in Fleet Street, that's what stood on the site. What you see behind me is typical of a jewellery quarter factory, a courtyard. Behind me, we have the North Range, which is south-facing and therefore has lots of windows within it to make sure that we can flood the workers inside with as much light as possible. Opposite the North Range, originally, the South Range was a single story, completely separate building. The reason for this was because of the fire risk, because that's where they cast the brass. Once the brass casting had been made, it needed to be treated with acid. And that was done in the center of the courtyard, in the dippy shed, where it was dipped in acid. Past that and right at the far end of the courtyard, what we have is we have two levels. A basement where the gas engine stood. That was driving all of the machinery within the factory. And it made a terrible thumping sound. Therefore, very appropriate. I think that what they should do is they should actually put the toilets for the staff up above the gas engine on the platform that you can see. Here we are in the stamp room a room that's a mix of both men and women. Men's work is down here. It's hot, it's sweaty, and you're in a pit. Not the best place to be. What they're doing is they're operating these drop forges. These drop forges were found at this time all through the jewellery quarter. The purpose behind them was to turn a nice flat piece of metal like this into one that's got the impression of the coffin fitting on top of it. Now you may be wondering why I've got my foot in this rope. Above me there's a rotating shaft and this rope goes over that rotating shaft. As I push down hard on this rope what it will do is it will create some friction between the rope and the rotating shaft and what that will do is will help lift this heavy weight. That heavy weight will then as I release the pressure will then come crashing down. Of course, what I need to do is make sure that in that space I've put this piece of flat metal in and I've actually got my hands out the way as well. With my desire to make as much money as I possibly could, sometimes I would take shortcuts and that would lead to accidents. If I didn't quite get my hands out of the way fast enough, then I might end up with less fingers than I came to work with. It was easy to spot a man who worked in the drop forge industry in the jewellery quarter because standing on their right leg all day long, with constantly pushing up and down with their left leg, they had an unbalanced muscle. And therefore, what they did was they walked with a rather unusual gait. Equally as dangerous was the women's work, working over here next to the windows on the fly presses. What they were trying to do was to remove the excess material from the pressings that the men had made whilst they were down in the pit. They would push the fly press away from them to open it up, put the metal inside and then pull it back down with great force. The women that worked in here were strong and muscular. In fact, it was said that the men would never argue with the women that worked here because the chances are they're going to give them a right hook. We now find ourselves within the warehouse. And this is where they would have packed and dispatched all of Newman Brothers' market-leading goods, whether that was something as simple as a screw for a coffin lid or something like their top-of-the-range Japan handles. Funeral undertakers particularly loved the way that Newman Brothers would pack everything so everything arrived absolutely in perfect condition. In the early 1900s, the fittings on the coffin alone would account for about 50% of the total cost of the funeral. To compare that with today's costs, that would only be about 5%. Part of that being the materials that they're made out of. Then metal, today very much plastics. Human Brothers had a great reputation with regards to the range of products that they had. But they were also prepared to move with the times as well. As cremation started to become more popular, then some of those items started to come in, like small caskets or urns, or even trolleys to move coffins as well. Once all the items have been packaged, whether that's the shrouds up above us 
or whether it's the metal items in this room, then what they do is they find their way into the hoist that will take it all the way down to the loading docks down at the entrance to the courtyard. We're now in the office of Newman Brothers. And although called Newman Brothers, it was in fact their father, Alfred, that set up the company. When their father died in 1933, the two brothers took over complete control of the company. One looking after the finances, that's Horace. The other who was very much more the people's person was George, the younger of the two. He was very much always to be seen inside the factory itself, chatting to people and making sure that what happened was things were happy amongst the workers there. There was a great family atmosphere here within Newman Brothers and that didn't change when the brothers died. And in fact, the final owner of the company, Joyce Green, well, she was invited to the Christmas parties before she even worked for the company. Now, Joyce used to work for a company across the road. In fact, they were suppliers to Newman Brothers. They used to supply metal rods. Joyce would often be sent over here to have a cup of tea, but also with the instructions that if she could pick up an order while she was over here, then that would actually be more to the good. When her own boss died, what happened was, there was no job for Joyce to go to, there was only one place where she could go, and that was here to Newman Brothers. When Joyce started working here in the early 50s, she was looking after the books. But she also innovated in some other ways as well. She introduced, for instance, carbon paper. Carbon paper we think today has been, well, just something that we wouldn't use anymore. But at that time, what they were doing is they were writing out three and four copies of orders. So Joyce really streamlined the business and she continued to run it all the way up until 1999 when she sold it to Advantage West Midlands. We're now in the shroud room. This room had two main machines within it. One being the cutting machines, relatively quiet and hand operated. The others were the sewing machines, 11 of them in total, all sat in front of the windows to use the maximum amount of light that they could for the fine work that was done here. As well as making shrouds, what they did was they made coffin linings as well. Some of them quite simple and plain, some of them with that floral pattern. Again, another example of a plain coffin lining. However, if what you want to do is you want to splash out on the coffin, then maybe you might have them lined in what the staff refer to as bonbons because what they did was they remind them of the old Sherbet bonbon. Great room to work in. The atmosphere was just fantastic. Lots of laughing and um, music being played through the pipe system that came through the speakers above. They decorated the workspace and what they would also do is they would even make their own toast, toasted on the fire with a toasting fork that was actually made in-house. Let me just tell you about this little book. This was actually created by one of the seamstresses learning her trade. Inside, what she's got is her hand-drawn pictures of how the shroud should look, with little samples of the types of material that ought to be used within those shrouds. For me, this is just one of the real gems, the real human touches here within Human Brothers.